So we are recording in progress. Um, we are back with our medical ethics. And it's wonderful to have you guys uh, online as well. Um, tonight, plastic surgery. So plastic surgery is massive, a massive um, area, which, um, which I think what, what would be best is in order to be able to get into the halachic aspects of it is best that we decided that Dr. Didi would give us an introduction and give us a bit of a gamut of what plastic surgery actually is from, well, not just plastic surgery, but everything that will fall into that area so that we can discuss the different concepts. And we're gonna start from the least, least, um, yeah. We start with the least, uh, what, what we call it? Least invasive. To least invasive, invasive to the most invasive. There we go. So I do need to have a disclaimer. I do work for a company that does make Botox. So, <laughs> but I have no plans to promote it in this speech. I would just like to say that. <laughs> I have no samples on me. And <laughs> so give me samples. They give us free Botox <laughs> if you want it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's my disclaimer before we start. Um, as you know, I'm a pelvic surgeon. And um, when you think about plastic surgery, it's really the idea of improving the way you look to yourself generally. And when we think about plastics, and actually, we looked up the history of what the word plastic surgery is, because you would think that it has to do with plastic injections, right? Um, like I said, <laughs> I told Rabbi Gotti today that Joan Rivers had so much plastic surgery, she said she would be around longer than Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> So, but the word plastic actually comes from the Greek word to sculpt, right? So actually, I, I thought that was really fascinating because I didn't realize that that was an ancient term. I thought that it was a modern term. And that's probably where plastic itself comes from. That's oh, material for sure. That you can use to sculpt. For sure, for right. sure. And, um, and what else was I going to say? Okay, so <laughs> plastic surgery has two ways. We can look at it in two ways, right? It could be cosmetic, where you're looking at yourself and you want to change something about yourself, just whether it be vanity, whether because you feel in your culture you look different than someone else, or it could be reconstructive. Reconstructive is when you would have possibly a mastectomy, right? Removal of a breast due to breast cancer. And then you would have reconstruction to fix that. Or if a child was born with a congenital defect, like a cleft palate, right? Then we might do surgery to correct that. That's called reconstructive. So you have those two pulls. I think today what we're mostly gonna be dealing with is cosmetic surgery and we had been sitting there thinking about all the different things that could be in that range. So on one side, you have basic things like getting your ears pierced and whitening your teeth, right? And then on the other hand, you have someone who lost 200 pounds and wants full body contouring, right? And body contouring means that we remove all of the excess skin and fat and we tuck up everything. And that is extensive surgery, right? So we remove the arm flaps, we remove thigh skin, we do a, a tummy tuck. Um, you can also have extensive surgery for your face, um, you know, and depending on the type of surgery you have also depends on the anesthesia you have, right? So that anesthesia also carries its own risk. So Think about those, that range of things. In the middle of those things, we have basic things. We have an eye lift, a nose job, uh, you know, uh, breast implants. We also have Botox and derma fillers, right? Fillers for any wrinkles. So there's lots of things, hair, even hair plugs, right? So you have lots of different things out there that can be construed as 
classics, right? And so are they halakhically permissible? Can we do them according to Jewish law? And so I think, and it's very interesting to see how we look at it. One quick question. Are the halakhas different for reconstructive than elective? For sure. Absolutely. For sure. If it changes your functionality, it for sure changes. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to try and go through the prohibitions that are possible with regards to plastic surgery, with regards to what, what can their, what halachic issues may this fall under the category because plastic surgery is relatively new. And uh, in fact, we don't have much, um, usually we have response of going back hundreds of years. There's no response of with focusing on plastic surgery until Lord Jacobowitz uh, in the 1960s, 60s. put out mm. a response. It was before he was chief rabbi of Britain. And he, he spoke, I believe, in the United States. He gave a lecture and he spoke about that. And that's where he started the, our response. So our response is brand, brand new. And um, I'd like to say why, actually. I think it's fascinating. Like, this is a relatively new idea to halakha. Why is that? Because two things. One is Simmelweis. So he was the, the, the physician that figured out that we need to have our hands clean prior to doing surgery. So, you know, in the battlefield, when they would sew people back up, right, it was not an aseptic environment. There was bacteria, there was dirt, everything was left there. And so that changed everything because the, the chances of dying from sepsis or infection was so high that once we introduced aseptic technique in the surgical field, we reduced that risk. And then the other thing that's important is that the advent of true general anesthesia that worked and did not have a high mortality rate, because when they started doing the initial um, anesthetics were actually like ether and cocaine, right? <laughs> and so they had a very high mortality rate. Um, and they didn't understand where the therapeutic window was, right? So they were frequently outside the therapeutic window and they're like, I'm sorry, they died of anesthetic. Or on the other hand, prior to anesthesia, you would never consider doing something very minor, like an eye lift or a nose job, right? Because you would be in too much pain. You couldn't tolerate it. And so with the advent of both good anesthetic, which could also be just twilight sleep or general anesthetic, as well as aseptic technique, if you look at the generality of plastic surgery, the risk today is the risk of a major complication related to plastic surgery is less than about 2% for all comers. And I think that that's important to realize. So you know, it wasn't really relevant until Dr. Jacob, Rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Jacobovitz was asked the question. Right. Um, okay, so a couple of the, pray, well, so what we, what, we, what we want to do is we want to try and list the, the possible prohibitions that could come up with regards to putting oneself under the knife for this specific area, and then try and see how we can find a way forward because clearly there are openings with regards to numerous opportunities of getting, uh, getting different procedures of, of plastic surgery. The first is there is a prohibition or there's an obligation when the Torah tells us you should, you should guard very much one's soul, which means that we're not allowed to put ourselves into a situation of danger and therefore unnecessary um, procedures could fall under that category. Now, um, something that I did notice, there, there clearly are, uh, uh, Rabbi Avadi Yosef, is, he, he does allow plastic surgery for certain circumstances, we'll come to that. He says, it can only be done through a doctor, or through a surgeon who has years of, of experience in the specific field. And through, through for a successful surgeon who has years of experience in this specific field, which is we want to minimize that amount 
of danger that is that exists. Then the other part is chovul uh, ba'atzma. There is a prohibition of of mutilating oneself. One is prohibited to say, "I don't need my my fourth finger over here. I don't like it. It sticks out. I choose to get rid of it." They, one's not allowed to mutilate oneself um, from from any perspective. So the question really comes. Um, if you're not allowed to mutilate yourself, are you allowed to, is a woman, let's just start with the simplest, it, may a woman get her ears pierced? May you get your ears pierced? Is that part of mutilation? Well, if they are, well, how many piercings may, is, would fall under that category that it's okay to get them pierced? Two, five, 10, 12, can one put a massive, uh, African, um, the dilator thing, dilator, can one, right? And then one goes, <coughs> it, it, it moves across, right across that, 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 um, that plane goes right to the extremes. I mean, the, the extremes that people, the advances, the advan advances of modern technology and the extremes that people wish for themselves are very extreme. People have put um, spikes in their head, have them, have them put into their head, put zippers in their lips. They're, they'll do numerous crazy things, put pieces underneath their skin for, because they choose that. Let, let's, I mean, we'll also include the concepts of, um, of tattoos. How extreme, may one have one tattoo, may one have a number of tattoos, Whatever. There is a separate prohibition with regards to tissues, but does that fall under the category of, of Kabbalah? Because Kabbalah, in a way, there's also self-expression, self right? So some of that could be Very much. either social mores, like, okay, our society says it's okay for people, men and women, actually, to have their ears pierced, right? Our society today is also saying to the general public, it's okay to have a tattoo, but how many? Is it okay to have it on your face? Is it okay to have it? So there's a social more perspective, right? But then there's also this idea of self-expression. And that's very much influenced by a community as well. I would, I would venture to say, having lived in Portland, mm. right? Having lived in Portland, it, I would say every second or third person has a tattoo, a visible tattoo. Here too. Here you too. don't find that? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I think Definitely. it's so common. I think, yeah, like really, every second you know, or third person. Not a second or third, but like somebody you wouldn't expect, like uh, you know, like an upper middle class woman middle that class. you know Correct. they they have some kind of tattoo. Yeah, yeah. Did everybody see the curb your enthusiasm where his mother was eighty five and got a tattoo? No, I didn't see that one. <laughs> And then she wasn't buried in the Jewish cemetery. Oh so God. then she, he had to finagle to get her in the Jewish was cemetery. The that, by the way, is not true. Did you know Alan is Mary David? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know. You guys won't remember, but a number of months ago when the Torah spoke about prohibitions of tattoos, someone I, I mentioned, what about tattoos? Do you remember? I was like, what about tattoos? I kept bringing it up, what about tattoos? Someone came up to me afterwards, told me in extreme privacy that he had gotten a tattoo when he was in, uh, in college. He completely regrets it. His kids do not even know about it. And he wants to know if he's going to be able to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. Oh, okay. It's rubbish that you cannot get buried in a Jewish cemetery just because one has. Tattoos. Where did that come from? It's oh, Baba Meisa. So where did it come from? <laughs> How come every That's single a, person knows about their kid? Exactly. exactly. Everybody says it. That's it. So hey. it's every Jewish mother so says it to get. From? Every Jewish mother says it to the kids in order to get so. the kids to avoid getting it. So where did it come from? <laughs> That's it. So I said that to my son. After oh, you did. did. There we go. And, my, I, and, and what he did, he went up to one of the neighbors who happened to work for Wine for the Shalom Cemetery. She was a mortician. 
and she told him that it was nonsense. So he came home with mom. This is not true. No! There you go. There's no mom. He did it in high school. Oh, kids, so stupid cute. kids. Did it. Oh my goodness. So he went to Mrs. Feldman and she said, it was not true. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I knew of someone who had who had gone through a it's crazy. He'd gone through a conversion and while he was going through the process of conversion, they'd gone to Israel together, took off his shirt and down his back massive cross. Massive cross. That was like whoa. It was just like, and like he, we spoke about it and like he was talking about how many thousands of dollars it would cost him to get it removed and like how uncomfortable, it, it, it was just, wow, it was fascinating. Okay, we okay, Kabbalah. So, so um, mutilation, self-mutilation is prohibited. In fact, we know that there are halakhas. If a person mutilates someone else, you have obligations of payments. So, um, so we know that there's a prohibition and one's not, your body is not yours for the abuse. We need to take care of our body. We have an obligation to take care of our body. We, our body is the vehicle for the soul, and in, we need to make sure that that is in its, in, at its greatest functionality. Um, so that is Hachover. Then there is an issue called Meshaneh Habriot. So um, if a person sees someone who is extremely different, uh, if a person sees a, um, a midget for the first time in his life, they actually make a bracha, Baruch Mishanabira, blessed be God, the one who changes creation, which means that in general, all of us have been created in a normal way. We all look with a, the way God created us is in this beautiful functionality, beautiful look, the way the way each of us are different and unique uh, with our, I'm going to say it, with our genders, male and female, they're, they're, they're created specifically by God. Who are you to go and choose that you want to change that? Who gives you the right to go and to adjust that? So that's another question that, that there's a, an issue. And then the issue, the, the next issue that came up is Lotilvash, there's a prohibition of a man behaving like a woman. For example, a man is prohibited to wear a dress. A man is prohibited to wear a dress um, or whatever other clothing. Dying belt. hair. Dying hair. Right, like dying hair. Oh, a yeah. man, right? Doesn't a man have those issues a lot of people? Yeah, I'm sure I haven't looked. I haven't looked into that, but I'm I'm <laughs> sure. But like, I'm curious now. Like, it's become such a common common practice. I know, like for example, women wearing pants has has be, has slid very much across. Like in the '60s, I don't think I don't know. There was a time period where women didn't wear pants at all, and that has the society has moved across to a place where it is much more normal for that 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 prohibition does not exist. Um, and I guess that is also going to depend on, with regards to our current societies, how the society functions, and how the society means, and how the society begins to decay, with regards to whether this prohibition exists of no till Um Is there anything else? Well, one of the things that we were thinking about when we talked about this is there are other reasons that people embark on plastic surgery. Right, so there's this whole idea today about age discrimination. Like, why are people using Botox even in their 30s and 40s? Why? Because they are worried about age discrimination at work. Why do people get facelifts or eyelifts? Well, yeah, because it's very common today. It's done as an outpatient. It's cheaper. It's safer. But one of the reasons is because of age discrimination. But the other thing that we, we embarked upon when we were doing our research for this topic was there's actually multiple studies showing that more beautiful people actually are possibly more successful. 
sure. Okay, but every culture has its own idea of beauty, right? <clears throat> so let's just take American culture. So they they basically what they did is they showed that between ten beautiful people ended up ha- making ten to twelve percent more than their peers, and then they also took resumes and they changed the names and the picture with it and they found that when they changed it to a more beautiful picture they were more likely to get an interview than the ones that were not good looking they also found that even in an education experience like college students actually paid attention more to a lecturer that they perceived to be more pretty and so the question is why? There was the, so one of the things I read it was a psychological component, was that beautiful people are perceived as being more socially aware, hmm. right? They have had more social opportunities. That's, that's just something that came out of it. It is what it is, unfortunately. I mean, just like, you know, today, most people are saying, it's not about not seeing color. It's that we see color and then we acknowledge that people are different, right? And so it's just, I think it's an interesting dynamic when we think about that. And then, you know, Rav Gotti wanted to talk a little bit about like our relationships with our spouses. You know, how, what is our relationship? If you want to change something on your body, does your spouse get to weigh in on that? What if your spouse doesn't <laughs> like it? What if you're doing it just for your spouse and not for yourself? So then you get into a whole other discussion about that. Right. Um, one of the, so Rabbi Vajir Yosef and a number of other rabbis that actually speak specifically with regards to a girl who approached them and asked if she could get a nose job in order to because she was having a difficult time getting a shit off and would that be permitted and they all agreed that that it was definitely permitted in fact um so this this category we'll call it shalom by peace in the home seems to be a clear path forward that one may utilize plastic surgery in order to increase a relationship between a husband and wife or in order to increase the chances of a girl finding a shut up um, from that perspective in order to be in, in order to undergo plastic surgery. What we did point out or what we did talk about is that needs to be very well clarified. Meaning if someone were to come and ask me about plastic surgery, me as a rabbi, about plastic surgery from a perspective of peace in the home. I really want to, I want to check where their relationship stands from a perspective of, is there, you know, have they gone through therapy? Have they gone through, have they done their personal work? And is the relationship in an emotional healthy place that the only thing that's sticking out over here is that there's a deformity or whatever it is that is really bugging the wife or the husband. And therefore they want to have that adjusted in order to increase that. Very often, unfortunately, or uh, this is my okay, this is my personal perspective, or that people who are constantly getting um, uh, Botox or constantly having improvements on their body are not necessarily having those improvements done in order to enhance their personal relation between their spouse and themselves and their spouse as much as per se as to make themselves more attractive. To other people, and that probably would fall under the category of prohibition. And just trying to be more attractive to everyone else, there, there, are the numerous problems and issues that come up when one behaves in such a way and is trying to be seductive towards other people. You've got a healthy, health, a great healthy relation between you and your spouse, and you're trying to make yourself look better every time you walk out the house. That should be a red flag. Mm-hmm. However, if there is an issue, you know, if it is to build that connection between the spouse and, and, and the, the two spouses, then that clearly is a path forward and we may open the door for plastic surgery for specific areas. Okay, yeah. 
case of a Jewish actor or actress on the big screen, that has to have plastic surgery. Right. What does that mix? So it looks like halakhically, if it changes your ability to work in any way or it is causing you significant psychological distress that is grounds for taking it you know taking it to the next level but i think what we're trying to really say is that we didn't hear what the question was oh the question was if you're a jewish actor and you think that your job is in peril because you don't look a specific way could you go ahead with it? That was the question. So with regards to um, Parnas, it, it, it falls under that category called Parnas. Parnas is a person's financial income, the ability of being able to bring in, bring in significant more income. There, There is this space of being able to um, go, you know, have a modification or remove something that is disturbing in order to increase their financial income. I, I think that one thing that has popped up to me is that um, that making oneself look better in the general society's perspective is very different to making oneself personally look better when the general society think that that is sick sick that is very not a, not appealing having extremities would fall under that category of mutilation when whereas um, certain other parts other areas of um, you know I think like a nose job is like the simplest that one can go is that that clearly is just an improvement of, of the body Certain other areas, for example, breast implants, that's really a question of like, what does that, where does that fall under, under, under a large category of like, is that normal? Is that not normal? Is, does, does halacha an enable one to increase it from that perspective? And then there's also that self -percep perception of like, how am I comfortable? Am I uncomfortable with the way I look? And how do other people Look, uh, look at me. From you know that what an interesting situation would be? Is this frequently will happen? A, a woman says that she has neck and back pain because her breasts are too large. She's married, she's been married for years, and she would like to, for health reasons, pursue a breast reduction. Okay, well, then what, how does this affect her and her relationship with her husband? Can she do it? She could probably do it because it is relatively safe and she's doing it for a reason that would change her health, right? She will no longer have headaches. She will no longer have shoulder and back pain and she might even like her body better. But then again, there is a relationships. So I just, I think that's that that's- married like, her, so no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the other thing is that we also, in, in researching for this lecture, we also saw that there's a significant amount of people who undergo plastic surgery who then have regret. I think it's mm -hmm. important to realize that. And also to realize that today, men are embarking on plastic surgery almost as much as women. Yeah. Eyelids, face, yeah. tummy tuck, yeah, everything. <laughs> I hope no one heard that. <laughs> 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 there's the enhancement, let's say, but then there's the over enhancing people who get like keep on doing over and right. Over it's like Pamela the... Anderson or Michael Jackson, right? right. Yeah, the, yeah. Like they looked ridiculous. Right. Joan Rivers looked ridiculous. It gets to a point where it's almost like they psychologically have a trauma that they cannot overcome but there's no one keeping them in check, right? And so the way I look at it is there's moderation. And thankfully, tied to a shoal and tied to a community, you start to realize that there's variation in what people look like. 
They nice. don't all need to look like this right. or like this or like this in compartments. And I think that being tied to a Jewish community makes you realize that it's not only physical. And almost every lecture that we've given so far shows that there's some kind of connection between the physical and spiritual. Right. Um, one of the, I, I, we didn't go into this, but I do want to just point it out since this week is like Bomber, it's appropriate to mention the story that Rabbi Lezer ben Rabbi Shimon. So Rabbi, the, the, the famous story is that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai <coughs> during the, the, the period of the Romans in, in the land of Israel, they had to go, he had to go into hiding because he had spoken negatively about the Romans. He went into hiding and he stayed in the cave for 12 years. He stayed in the cave with his son, Rabbi Eliezer. And after 12 years, they came out and it, he revealed the Kabbalah, he revealed, he wrote the Zohar. It's the famous story of Rabbi, of Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Shimon, it came out um, many many are of the opinion that they came out on Lag Omer, but Lag Omer is this week where we celebrate the life of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and also the life of his son. The Tzitz Eliezer he actually quotes this famous story about Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon. The story of, of Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon is it, it is very disturbing. What happened was Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon he walked he he was traveling on a on his donkey. He was traveling towards the city, and he said, "I saw a person who was extremely ugly, so ugly that I had never seen someone as ugly as this person in my life." And he was walking towards me, and he said, "Shalom," and I did not reply. And he said to me, "Shalom," a second time, and I did not. Reply. And he said to me, Shalom, a third time. And he said, why don't you, he said, why don't you answer me? And he said, I've never seen someone as ugly as you. That's, that's what he said straight. <laughs> so this what, is a terrible oh, story. It's a terrible, terrible story. What, what he did, what, so he answered, <laughs> what this person answered to Rabbi Yezman Rabbi Shimon, he said, why don't you go and tell the person who created me that I did, that he did a bad job. And immediately Rabbi Yeza understood that he, he understood that he had made a, a, a terrible mistake. He said, I got off my donkey, I got off, he got off his donkey and he followed him, begging him to forgive him and he refused to forgive him. And he came to the synagogue and everyone stood out for Rabbi Yeza and Rabbi Shimon, the, the great Torah sage. And um, they asked, why is Rabbi Ezra, why is he following this individual? And they said to him, why are you doing this? So the, the person told him, I said hi to him, and he refused. And then he asked me why I looked so ugly, and I told him to go find him, you know, go, go tell God. So they asked him to forgive, they asked him to forgive Rabbi Ezra, um because of the honor of the community. Because he's such a great influential rabbi, they asked him to forgive they asked this individual to forgive Rabbi Yezer, and he did. He said, I'm not forgiving you. I think that what you did was wrong. I'm not forgiving you uh, for myself, but I'm forgiving you because of the honor of the community, because you're a great rabbi. And Rabbi Yezer went and, and he wrote a, a, um, a statement, and he said, a person should always be soft like a weed and not hard like a tree, not hard like a... a not unyielding. Unyielding. Correct. That, that was that was that was the statement. So the Tzitzeliezer he grabs that statement and that statement of Rabbi Yezer and said, clearly, Rabbi Yezer had had one perspective, and in one moment he recognized that he was completely misunderstood. He completely misunderstood how people are meant to look. People are meant to look the way they're meant to look. The person goes and tries to change. So Rabbi Yezer, while he was walking and he saw this ugly person. He had a perspective that this person should not look this way. The moment the person answered him and said, why didn't you go and tell my creator that he did a bad job? Rabbi Yeza understood mm -hmm. that he made a mistake. People are going to look the way they, they look. And the Tzitzit Yezer, who died in the, in the late 
in, in the early 90s, he said that we learn from this war. We learn from this story that it's not so simple to go and adjust the way a person looks. A person may think that they look ugly. This is the way God created you, then that's the way you're meant to be. That's his perspective. In fact, the Tzitzeliezer is against the concept of, of plastic surgery. And in general. In general. In general, he was against the concept of the, 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 the concept of, of plastic surgery when it's not reconstructed. Let's just be very clear. When it's not reconstructed. Um, however, what's interesting is that he was the chief rabbi of, he was the main halachic authority of the Shari Tzedek Hospital. And they usually will follow Mitzitzeliezer's opinion in all, in all perspectives. But with regards to plastic surgery, they actually have a successful plastic surgery department wow. at, at Shari Tzedek. And my understanding is that he's going from a perspective uh, or they're following the perspective of Rabbi Moshe, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein holds that it is prohibited, uh, sorry, permissible to get plastic surgery from the perspective of one's allowed to improve oneself from, the, from that perspective. Um, so, 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 like, just to kind of, do we have any questions, by the way? It's, it's almost like, so many other things in Judaism. How do you, I mean, who is this? Who are these halachas? In fact, pick a, pick a number. 95% of the people who are thinking about having, 98% who are thinking of having plastic surgery aren't worried about the halacha of the process. So who's, who, how do you, who are you addressing the halacha to? Just the Orthodox or Jewish community, it's, you know, there's, it's just most people would, would go. Well, I think that's that, I mean, halacha is something that is relevant no matter where we are, right? And halacha adjusts and halacha, it, it becomes, it, it, it uh, adapts itself to our society, to where we go and how, with the modifications of society. Now, agree. Your average, I don't, I, you know, other people can talk, or, or, or give, give more, more facts, but your average um, Orthodox Jewish girl is probably not getting a, a, a nose job, but perhaps they are. And if they want to go and have one, um, what is the halakh perspective? That's, you know, yeah. Can, you know, a, a, a woman who's, um, Who's post giving having given birth an Orthodox woman and her husband wants her to have a tummy tuck or she wants to have a tummy tuck? Can she have one? Can she choose to go and have one? That is a, a question that that can be posed that that gets posed and, and and addressed from a halakhic perspective. So it always is going to be relevant, and we need to have a Torah perspective on how things apply and where they apply. In what situation we're going to deal with all of that and and have a lot of guidance from 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 each perspective. But basically, it's for our I mean, our Klal Yisrael that this is all. Makes you could sense. see you could see it for a lot of different things, right? Yeah. Like not everyone keeps the laws of Jewish family purity, right? They because either they don't know or they don't care, but the ones that do will ask rabbis for assistance in how Jewish law permits it. You know, I you could possibly even say the same thing for American society, right? There are certain things that people do that they think are legal and just don't, or they don't care to think about, it, right? So, I mean, I think the key to these lectures is that if you do want guidance, within Jewish law, is it permissible? And how should you go about getting the guidance and right. looking at mm -hmm. all the different interpretations of that law and deciding what works for you? Instead of going to a doctor who wants to do the surgery, if you really want to know, you go to a rabbi. Are there, 
Are yeah, there, I think your nose is great. Okay. <laughs> are there specialists that, I mean, that, that you know, like, will answer the halakha questions for plastic surgery? Do you know anyone that, that functions in, in that role? I think your average rabbi is, I mean, the, the, the yeah. halakhic authority, like, for example, Rabbi Vaidya Yosef, who's the, who's the Torah's age, and he answered halakhic questions from that perspective very clearly, and that they were published. And Ramosha Feinstein, he published it, it's all published. <laughs> yeah, so clearly it is something that is common, that is dealt with, that is within the realms. Yeah. Um, what I do want to bring out is. Um, it's a valid point. Yeah, it's. But there's plenty of Jews. <laughs> there's plenty of Jews who want to hear it too. I was going to say, this has been the case. Justify it. That's what, and that's what David always said. It's just shop around till you find shop the around. rabbi that'll give you the right yeah. answer. And you're right. I mean, the right beauty, answer. I would say, <laughs> I would say the beauty of Judaism is what we say, Shivam Panam the Torah. Right. That there's 70 bases of the Torah, right? That there's multiple interpretations and there's grounds for interpretation. You know, at work, sometimes people will say, like, why is every Jew different, <laughs> yeah. right? And I say that, like, I want you to realize that Jews don't have a Vatican. We don't have one ruling party that says this is the rule, right? And so, you know, there's a lot of mitzvahs in the Torah. I think we all try to do the best we can. And so I think this is a great segue that I want to that I want to talk about this this concept of sneers. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. so great. That um, so so what is wh where you know we kind of started with regards to we'll start off on 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 the one extreme, um, for example, getting one's ears pierced. Is that fall under does that fall under the category of, of mutilation or not? And to the other extreme putting spikes inside one's head. Does that fall under the, the, the category of mutilation? So we'll all agree that getting, a, getting an earring, uh, getting, earring, getting one's ears, a woman getting her ears pierced is not mutilation. We'll all agree that getting spikes put inside one's head or a zipper inside one's lip would fall under the category of mutilation, okay? And then we have this very, like, we'll have, you know, getting three earrings, uh, a belly pierce, whatever else, right? And then we get we get to our current, our, you know, all of that starts to become this gray area of what is permitted and what's not, what is considered mutilation, what's not considered mutilation, what is appropriate and what's not appropriate. So much of this of tonight's topic is falling under the category of like, is it appropriate or is it not appropriate? And the example that I gave, or that my rabbi, my rabbi gave, he spoke about sneers. Rabbi Yitzchak Berkowitz, whenever he speaks about the concept of sneer, sneer is loosely translated as modesty, you know, modesty. So the, the, the joke the joke is, um, do you know the Journey song yeah. about the wedding? And he's, he wants to start a wedding and end the wedding, and he's talking about, it, it, there's a funny song out there where, someone he calls a wedding planner. They say, my daughter just got married. We just got engaged. They say, oh, mazel tov. And the whole song is about how he's taking this wedding over the top. And, you know, and don't think that you're going to give out benchers. Benching is old fashioned. You got to give a set of Talmud to every guest. <laughs> you know, like, and you're talking about the smorgasbord and the, the wedding dress and this and the that and this, and that, right? And, and at the end of the conversation, he's like, uh, I, we were looking for something a bit more modest. So he says, 
oh, you want modest, then on the invitation, make sure to write that everyone should please rest appropriately, <laughs> that we all keep the laws of the laws of modesty. Modesty is so much more, is, is not so much a, a question of how long a per, uh, one's, one's skirt is or how shirt or, you know, um, how a person dresses. The way my Rebbe used to put it, he said very simply, look in the mirror and say, do I look like a princess? Do I look like a prince? Would I walk out um, with dignity? Modesty is... Sniut is is def, is better translated from a perspective of dignity. We represent something more than just the little self that I am, and therefore, when we talk about um, when we talk about the this huge gray area, from the spikes in one's head to the five piercings, whatever that is, it's a question of like. I'm representing something more than just who I am right over here. And how do I dress when I'm doing, when I'm stepping out of the house? How do I look and how am I representing? What am I representing? Do I represent something of dignity? Do I represent something of, um, that, that is deserving of respect that people are looking up towards or do I, or, or do I not? And I think that that is a, a, a great litmus test with regards to how we should be behaving with regards to um, with regards to plastic surgery as well. I mean, we have seen people take plastic surgery to the extremes, to the extremes, trying to be, you know, trying to attract as much attention as possible without any sense of dignity whatsoever. Having a, you know, having a facelift or having a nose job or, or breast implantations, breast, they, they're not necessary, you know, it's all going to be from a perspective of, is this a dignified behavior or is it not? That is going to be so much more of that litmus test that is going to clarify the permissibility and the, and the impermissibility of this behavior. Um, <clears throat> and then, so, so in, in, to summarize, let's just pull these last three points. We want to just summarize and bring everything together. Um, we, we definitely spoke about extremities. We spoke about the simple things of, for example, of having um, teeth adjusted, defects that are clearly um, permissible, clearly permissible as long as it is done by someone who has a lot of experience, who has experience and that there is no danger involved. We have the extremities over there of mutilation that is clearly prohibited, that one is not, one may not. And then we have this gray area in between, and we have three guidances with regards to, or actually two, but um, one is for shalom bias, or we have three actually, right? One is for shalom bias, with improving one's relationship within one's home, in making the person, oh, well, yeah. I mean, let's just remember to include that, including in, in defects or improving oneself, we're talking about health, health issues as well. If one is, taking, one is doing a surgery that it will enable a person to look healthier or enable a person to be healthier, that clearly is permissible. Um, but then the question is, where it's not necessarily a question of shalom bai, or where it's not necessarily unhealthy, but the a spouse wants it, or one is trying to get a shit up and one wants to get surgery done. That we have seen Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi Vadio said, do feel, do agree that it is permissible. And then we also spoke from the perspective of in, um, being able to earn a better living. That's what we saw we spoke about. That, um, that, that definitely is an ability of being able to uh, a reason why when one may go ahead and do that um but then it does need to make sense right it, it, it's one can't go and uh go and get a a, a I, I don't know it, it needs to it needs to make absolute sense you, you know there i may you know your average person who's getting plastic surgery joanne rivers right she was getting plastic surgery 
is did not necessarily make sense because she needed that from a logical perspective or from whatever perspective that she felt that she needed. She, you know, she she needed that in order to increase her revenue, right? It was definitely was a uh, a personal a personal right. venture, which which could be more of the challenge. Anything else? Yeah. 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 It seems like the benefits is it's not, not whether or not you're mutilating your body, it's the reason why you're doing it. I think so too. Right. I think you have, no. I think what we're saying here is what's your intention? Is it to hurt yourself? Is it to improve yourself? Is it, you know, I definitely agree with you. Okay. Well, for joining us, so we will be having. That a, was a good one. Yeah. Oh, that that was awesome. It was a fun one. Awesome. I gotta get my tissue so bad. Okay, um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will be having Robert Myers will be joining us momentarily. So he'll be speaking about the Lone Soldiers project that he is running. He has an organization that he runs. And stick, stay well, around, yes. hang around, let's bring him in. This was really good for the yeah. people on Zoom. Yeah. Our good friends, Alyssa Hoffman, the Gottliebs, and the Rubens. Oh, good. Very good. Thank you. Rubens. Bye-bye. Good night, guys. Bye, guys. <clears throat> right? The thing is, the mores of the society or the, like, the mutilation like Come at, at, at one time the mutilation at one point like maybe in society would say that's mutilation yeah but it, it becomes moved. accept it moves toward acceptability correct so then i mean isn't there like a fence around the torah like they say like a lot of times there's a fence around the torah so you can't do this because of this so that does not apply to this i you know i think that that like um hi guys hi. welcome um i think one of the one of the things one of the one of the things is that um I, I, that's why i like this concept of dignity you know um there are certain certain things that are accepted certain things that are that are that are not sorry things that are appropriate and that are not appropriate and then as time moves as things pass things change right and what was dignified then right. is not dignified right. now what is dignified now was not dignified then. oh no and you're that, good. And, that works, and that's okay the car works within that within that within that realm of i think people would be surprised like uh, you know because i think most non-orthodox people think that orthodoxy is rigid because right so it's like kind of putting it out of its head in a way. right oh. well i think i think there's two parts to that i mean like i do definitely think that for example the hasidic world are putting phenomenal energy in order to retain a certain standard irrespective of how the world right. the world changes and modifies um and then a lot of the more modern so my society says to me, are can you talk to Rabbi Myers about my refrigerator as well. <laughs> with, my with son. As well. so <laughs> all right, I'll talk to him about your refrigerator. I guess the refrigerator isn't working or something. And he's like, how, I'm like, yeah. he's here though. I don't how know how he's gonna fix it there. But I mean, I think we, we have a great um you know, great guy, yes, yeah, so great source of guidance um, when with he regards first, to this. I mean, well, like Giving in this he Botox, was Gap here security prayer. Oh, okay. Came home it's for like three weeks and said, I'm going Botox back. I knew that Botox. was happening. I'm not saying. Like, I, I, but I, once I you start it, you can't stop. That's what you know, when people are in a lonely like, so like, period of time. You have to do it. You have to take every city or whatever it is. It's a procedure. By a rabbi. In there was a bunch of men, that, like right. Lone Soldier yeah, Center, so, like, but they didn't have it. Then he moved into know, like, the Lone Soldier Center's yeah, apartment, no, it's, <laughs> um, which was but it's fine, but it's it like is, a dorm. It's just strictly it and obsession. He got a little tired of the whole that dorm thing, right. and that then is, Rabbi Myers said, oh, perfect. well, I have an opening right. in my apartment, and one of the other guys in yeah. his yeah. unit, you your wife here, surviving, surviving, surviving. 
Is your daughter helping you a lot? And she is so sweet. Uh-huh. She's awesome. She was. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 So Drew technically is Lacha right now, which means that he, in theory, will be done with the service in February. Um, but it, but I don't think. No favor. Hey, when were you in Denver? How are you? Um, uh, 2010. So I don't. He argues with okay. me a lot. I think. I was. I think he's. We knew the carps. Okay. Well, yeah. our daughter was engaged to Laura. Oh, but that didn't work out. I knew the carps, but I I used to study with Rabbi Levi. I don't know where. So I know you know, Steve Laura. Oh, did you? Then we met. Yes, yeah. so over the years. That's funny. Looks like I wrote my life. That's fine. Because I know your wife's name. I yeah, I wonder if they, so. they probably. I, I'm okay. guessing. Nice. Nice. There's not, there's not that many, even though she's going to be a medic. Like, I'm well, sure I used to come all the time other. before COVID. Oh, really? Yeah, sure. Because we're doing Friday night Carl Bach minions. Okay. Nice to see you. Rabbi, I'm Lana. I'm Drew's mom. Oh, right. Thank you. Let's go. Yep. Well, he's Silberman, I, and this is my husband, Steve Horak. So it's a whole thing. We got lots of names. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. <laughs> so later. Yeah. And he's just the folks I recruited. Yeah. 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 So nice to meet you. We haven't been back. We used to come to the Lachaim Center. I'm Lana. I'm Steve Horak. Um, and we used to come periodically to the Lachaim Center, and then COVID, we sort of... You, do you have okay. any? Are there any other land soldier parents here? Yeah, we are, and they are. They are. You, 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 and so. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we, are you back we gotta get that. We gotta idea. get on your mailing list because we aren't getting send emails or anything. Okay, send any, yeah. You need to send your email. Oh wow! Well, 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 put yours in. Put your email. Oh my god. Oh, wow. I'm so oh, good. Good. My name on my watch. I got something that the rabbi was putting back in, but. Wow. Okay. Yeah, Rabbi, awesome. you right over here. Yeah. Okay. So there may be more. I, a people, a bunch of people sent me emails. A couple of them, I sent them your WhatsApp. A bunch okay. of people. Was, okay. I kept posting the things that. Oh yeah, these, these people. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I'm gonna sit down. I guess I have to sit yeah, down because I got to. You want to stand? No, no, no. Because the people. You want to drink? All right, fine. Yeah. I'm showing a few minutes back because I couldn't quite locate the place. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. I've actually yeah. been here before. You have. Do yes. I put it where the please yeah. as is or? Please add. Just put it in the next. Okay, let me say who I am. My name is Shalom Myers. I want to thank Rabbi Levy. I'm going to just tell you, I wanted to speak over here to tell what I'm doing. It's so people who are have learned soldier children can know about me. And I know Rabbi Levy's father. Oh. And I try to get his number. He's in South Africa. He's in, he's in Israel. 